Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a 5 p.m. block on a given Wednesday. And guess what? We have George Kaysen, and we're going to do a movie show now, and we're going to talk about the Gilded Age. You know, I minored in American history in college, I, and uh, we read a book by Lewis Mumford, uh, who, who died in 1990, but who wrote this book in 1932. It was called The Brown Decades. The Brown Decades was a 30 year period from the close of the Civil War till the middle 90s of the 19th century. And I, I don't know why, but it was my, my favorite part of American history. It was the part where the country sort of graduated from the Civil War, whatever that meant, um, and found itself, um, whatever that meant, um, in, in an industrial age. Um, and that changed things profoundly. You know, we moved a long way in those 30 years. And I'm still fascinated with it. And this movie, The Gilded Age, mm -hmm. is pretty much the story of those 30 years. It takes me back to my studies in college in American history. Mm -hmm. George, uh, you know, it's a documentary, so it doesn't have a plot except the reality of it. Um, can you sort of put your, your finger on the, the plot, if you will, of this documentary? Pretty much. It's like a historical um, vignette, you know, talks about right after the Civil War and how the, well, you know, the railroad barons started to get wealthier and wealthier and more and more powerful as the years rolled by to the point where J. Pierpont Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, they had enough Cornelius, Cornelius Vanderbilt. And Cornelius Perfect. Vanderbilt, right. They had ability to influence the Congress, Senate, House of Representatives, on their behalf to what they wanted, right? Because they had all this power, right? So you had power was consolidated in, in the hands of a few, and they even had able ability to, with presidents, to tell presidents what to do because they had that much power. And the whole behind this is, the, the, the woman who I've got court or whatever, the producer, the director, she wanted to show for the current day that there's similar, similar things happening. You've got a wealth, kind of concentrated wealth, and, and it's, in the, it's becoming more and more in the hands of the few. So that's basically what she's trying to show. And it showed Pierpont Morgan, it showed Cornelius Vanderbilt, it showed, um, uh, you know, uh, our Andrew Carnegie, and then all the reformers, Henry George, uh, Eliz Mary Elizabeth Lease, uh, I'm trying to think, oh, uh, William Jennings Bryan, who ran for president in 1896. He, he was winning, and then, and then he had all the workers, industrial workers. Um, I mean, they, they were not for, in the end, they weren't for him because the industrialists told them that they would be losing their jobs, they would be getting less benefits if William Jennings Bryan came in. So that's pretty much the, the gist of it. But then you can get into the particulars. Yeah. yeah I, okay. <clears throat> I found the movie took me beyond where I remembered it went in my class in American history. <clears throat> this was a formative period. You know, we were, you know, before 1865, we were in slavery. We were, we were all enslaved, if you will. Uh, maybe that's an overstatement, but we were all <clears throat> involved in that issue. The whole country was involved in that issue. We couldn't get away from it. Yeah. Um, after that, we had to get away from the Civil War. And in the Civil War, we had learned to be an industrial nation, the North, especially. Mm -hmm. Industry had come of age. And so this was an example of what happens when you have a part of the country that's recovering from the Civil War and in the reconstruction of the South and the you know, discovery of the West. But in the North, it was about money and power. It was about technology, about the Industrial Revolution as it you know, explored itself in, in, the, in America. And um, it started out with um, you know, this tension between the industrial power, the immigrants who had nothing, um, the power of capital um, and the lack of power of the people, pretty much everywhere. People, when I say people, I mean the working class. 
Okay, then, you know, this was a, a turning point. And if anybody wants to read a really good book, read the book by Lewis Mumford called The Brown Decades. It's still available, of course, and it is the statement of what happened in this country in that period. <clears throat> One of the things that happened, and you know, you could claim that we have great disparity now. We have disparity in wealth. We have disparity in race. We have disparity in you know, opportunities in education. And we're more conscious of that perhaps than we were before. Um, but in the 19th century, the disparity was tangible. It was everywhere. There were slums and tenements in the immigrant neighborhoods. People you know, were essentially starving, depending on what part of the business cycle you were in. <laughs> and it was America finding its way. We, we knew we could um, win a, a civil war. Uh, we knew we had as much industry or more than Europe. We were leading Europe in terms of developing industry here. Um, but we hadn't really worked it out. We hadn't worked out the politics. We hadn't worked out the social policy. And many, many things were happening. You know, although it was the 19th century, um, many things were happening all day long. So many events were disruptive, pivotal events. And, and America, you know, for all of its wealth, and it was relatively speaking, wealthy country in that period of time, or becoming a wealthy country, was cruel. It was uncaring. The social caring, um, political, you know, instrumentalities didn't really care about people. Um, it was it was hard on people, um, and um, it was divisive too. Because by the time you get to the later part of that thirty year period, uh, you have and you referred it. Let me, let me. We had a question come in, and I want to answer it. It distracted me for a minute. Yeah. And uh, the name of the movie is The Gilded Age. It's on Netflix, as I recall. So this is a Jay, is, this is a documentary on PBS, right? There you go. It's a documentary. Uh, it's that it's not the it's not the show. It's the documentary, and that's yeah. About, thank you for that. I didn't yeah. need to try to cut you off, but I think that was the question: of which of the two are we reviewing? And we're reviewing the documentary, right? We don't. We don't. Not, we, not I haven't the, seen the other one. The other one doesn't mean too much to me as a student of American history. It's interesting because it trips off the same period. So, I mean, when we get to, you know, the end of that century, um, and you referred to it, we had the emergence of the, the People's Party, the Populist Party, you named some of the leaders of it. And here's the thing, it all came to a crunch, okay, in 1896 in the presidential election. And uh, you were right to point out that um, William Jennings Bryan ran on behalf of the people, uh, the populist side of things. Uh, the, the, the hinterland, uh, the, the, the farmland, um, the small towns, the rural parts of America, as, as they existed at the time. And the uh, capital side was represented by um, William McKinley, who represented Wall Street. And, you know, clearly the number of votes, the, the amount of interest and passion was on the side of William Jennings Bryan, who was a great orator. Everybody remembers that. Um, but but there were um, tricks involved and the capital concentrations in Wall Street. Uh, this was a, an, a, an election in which money counted. Uh, it was a national election of some consequence. Everybody knew that it was kind of a mandate about what kind of country are we going to have? Will it be a country ruled by the people, of the people, by the people, for the people, in Lincoln's words, or was it going to be ruled by Wall Street? Um, and you're right, there was misinformation, there was confusion. This was a, 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 an election of propaganda, uh, and somehow uh, the capital concentrations in Wall Street convinced people that they would be injured if they, uh, economically, if they voted for William Jennings Bryan and the, and the populace. And that was the end of the People's Party. It was the end because he lost, and uh, everybody knows William McKinley won. Uh, look, we have McKinley High School, right? We don't have a William Jennings Bryan High School. Uh, <laughs> he won, and that that was the, the mandate. So from that point forward, um, the, the the capital concentrations of Wall Street, the moneyed class had a, had a, had leverage, and that showed uh, through the next few decades. Uh, it was regrettable because they were not particularly um, sensitive to racial issues or to social issues. 
Um, and the country really mm, was, was not a sweet place after that. And for a while, it didn't really recover in terms of a social consciousness until uh, FDR uh, in the 30s. We suffered. And we still are suffering, arguably, from the mandate out of that election. Very important. And that's why I really like the Gilded Age as a, as a time that we should study, you know? Most definitely. And, you know, um, with the McKinley election with uh, William Jennings Bryan, these big industrialists, I remember in the documentary, they said that they gave a lot of money to um, McKinley's campaign so, and he, so that he could go, I think he went around the country in a in a train, you know, to get votes, if, if I remember, I, mean, I know Brian did as well, but um, um, it was the big bucks that were able and to convince the, it seems that the, the farmers were for Jennings Brian, the more the more rural, but it was all the industrial uh, cities with all the factories that they were able to convince the workers to, to go with McKinley, because otherwise they were going to lose their jobs or whatever, you know, and they would have the benefits that they were getting. So very sly move to get the, the factory workers to vote for. for. That made a big difference um, because it was not in their interest at all. They would have been much better off had they voted for William Jennings Bryan um, and the you know popular party. So I think, you know, the other part of that is we're talking about an age in which industrialization was was king. And, and science and technology were king. Yeah. Um, and the country became strong because it, it, it did follow that path. Yeah. And uh, you know, these steel mills that Andrew Carnegie built, um, they were high tech, uh, so much so that you know, he, could, he spent most of his time in Europe knocking around. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it, while you know, the steel mills made enormous amounts of steel for the whole world, uh, and that was, uh, that was built, those skyscrapers, it built the railroads. Uh, steel was the basic building block. In fact, Carnegie started off in railroads and he realized that steel was more important. So he went to steel, self-made man, a very creative businessman. Um, so, I mean, you know, you saw extraordinary industrial leverage development power in that period. And what that told people, according to the documentary, and I accept this, it told people that there was a tomorrow, that things were always growing, improving, getting better, stronger. The United States was the greatest you know, country on earth because it was developing and growing so quickly. Uh, and because it, it, it valued the science, the technology, and the industrialization of the whole Northeast corridor. Um, and, and that had an effect on the way people thought, even poor people. Uh, they came to the conclusion that they could somehow get in on that, even though they weren't in on it yet. And immigrants came from all over the world to get in on it. Um, and so um, there was a spirit. There was, a, 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 I don't know if you could call it patriotism, but it was an optimism that the country had watching this, watching those smokestacks, watching the smoke billowing out all over town. <laughs> Yeah, I've studied Mumford's other books on urban planning, which he even, he even had a study of, of um, Honolulu, early study of Honolulu. So he was a very brilliant guy. But yeah, that was, that was, and, and you know, the results of that, I mean, I've been to events, you know, uh, at Newport, Rhode Island, where you had all the breakers and all these mansions. I mean, we're talking filthy rich, you know, we're talking unbelievable wealth. If there are beautiful mansions, I mean, architecturally, they're gorgeous, right? But what, how they got there is Jacob Reese did photos of, of the workers living in squalor, you know, in the New York tenements. So it's that big divide between between the very wealthy and, 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 and the workers. And, um, you know, as we've talked before, there's more of a more of a divide between the CEOs and the, the lower rank uh, employees, you know, the, the CEOs make 200 times a, a salary a year than, that, than the, the workers, you know, some of the workers. So, and, and hard, hard to make ends meet, you know. So definitely that age, you know, um, 
Yeah, that was the that was an age in which the the idea of the American corporate executive, you know, which was the model later for the world, mm -hmm. um, grew up. It, he was a or she not not many she's by the way uh, was a bureaucrat um, and all empowered and uh, had a duty to make money. Uh, it was the capital the capitalism. Capitalism was refined in that period, as in no other place in the world. And part of capitalism was this rampant thing about making money, hand of a fist, and, and to hell with your employees, and to hell with everybody, you know, this sort of libertarian, leave me alone, don't regulate me, don't control me, I'm here to make as much money as I possibly can, and if I have to dump on people, I will. And so you bring in the Pinkertons to beat up your, uh, your employees, you, you uh, resist uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, union type organizations um, and um, you, you maintain control. And uh, as a member of Frick, you know, there's a museum in New York called the Frick Museum. Frick was Carnegie's number one guy. And his job was to um, bring in um, goons, beat up the uh, employees who were uh, asking for higher wages. So, I mean, it was a hard, it was a hard time. And, and you're right. I mean, these people had so much money, it was filthy. I mean, the whole thing about filthy rich um, <laughs> and, 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 and they, had, they had a socialist society in New York where um, the, the movie opens with a discussion of, of um, the, a ball, a ball built around the whole notion of a gilded age where uh, I think it was 400 families controlled, attended this ball and they controlled the country. 400 families uh, and, the, and the disparity in wealth was was even greater than it is today from the top to the bottom. Um, and they control the railroads, which controlled the transportation, which controlled the price of goods. Um, what, a, what a deal. Uh, and, it, you know, um, they controlled steel, which controlled all construction. Um, and it was uh, the beginning of the movement in the Midwest. Um, which was very resentful of the railroads and the steel mills. Um, and for that matter, the oil through Rockefeller that came later, um, because they were taking advantage of the, of the people in the rural areas, and they were forcing them the, into agricultural squalor. Uh, and it changed the nature of being a farmer. Exactly. It sh changed the nature of small towns. And that resentment, was you know expressed in the emergence of the uh, populist the people's party uh, out in the midwest and and it's still with us today it's what it's what trump capitalized on uh, the resentment of the hinterland against uh, the, the wall street crowd uh, and um you know we we have to we have to know about this in order to understand what where we are today this phenomenon in the late 19th century hasn't really gone away. Hasn't. And you know, the series that you, uh, I was alluding to, The Gilded Age, that uh, it's a series that's uh, uh, going to be on TV. I think it's going to be on Netflix or whatever. Uh, th that depicts that age in color, even though this documentary was in black and white. I think they did that for a reason, you know, to show that that age. But that the, the, the Gilded Age uh, series is going to show different vignettes you know of 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 that age and i i looked a little bit at the at the initial um you know um what they were talking about and you see all these women in, in a fancy ballroom you know and that uh, that 400 in and and uh, in 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 you know in um new york city and then they talked about uh, i think it was um uh, mrs astor she was uh going against the grain she built this mansion uh, that was not liked by the high society so they i think they got high society a... was was the vanderbilts the vanderbilt uh, people had, had longer term money they were older money and they controlled uh, the you know the social pecking order yes yeah there was that they got into that too in this documentary so it's a very interesting documentary only about a little over an hour i would suggest people to take a look it'll give them a perspective as you were discussing yeah yeah, yeah. I had to make a choice between, you know, this black and white movie with a lot of very, very interesting photos, mm -hmm. uh, very well handled. You know, the narration was very well handled. The music was very well handled. I was fascinated. You know, it's funny, actually, George, you say that it was black and white. But to me, it wasn't black and white. 
I watched that movie and it was so colorful that it was, to me, subjectively, it was in color, the whole thing. <laughs> and if you ask me whether I prefer to watch the, uh, you know, the docudrama series uh, or this uh, documentary movie, I would, I would take the documentary any day. Um, it's, it's a revelation to understand our history. Um, you, you have stated in those words exactly what one of the reviews stated that it's very colorful, even though it's in black and white. So you're reiterating out of your own head, you know, what the reviewer was saying is that it's colorful, even though it's in black and white. And, and that's, that's what it comes, comes across as very colorful, even though there's no color. So yeah, de definitely. Um, but I think- You can... know, this reminds me of conversations that you and I have had before. Yeah. I mean, there was a movie, for example, I don't remember if we reviewed it or just talked about it, called Once, a, Once Upon a Time in America. Oh yeah, we uh, saw it. We, yeah, and it was, this was the, the next period, right? Uh, starting in the, the teens, uh, the teens of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could connect the dots because that was a pretty accurate rendition of the, of the history at the time. Yep. And so this hard scrapple movie, um, this hard scrapple time, by the way, reflected in a movie that won all kinds of awards called Ragtime. Ragtime was set right after the beginning of the 20th century in the early 1900s. And it was the hard scrapple times. And, you know, you know, we talk about large issues like, you know, industry and capital and agriculture. But in fact, people were suffering. Oh. They were trying to trying to find their next meal. And this was long before the depression. It was like a permanent depression uh, through the um, you know 1880s and into the 1890s. So I guess um, my point is um, I find this fascinating in the sense that my parents, who followed you know they came to this country in around uh, 1905. My grandparents and my parents were born in the early 1910, 1920. 1910, 1912, actually. Um, and they talked all the time about royalty in Europe, which was another way of saying they like rich people. We were not, believe me, rich. Um, and they talked about these fancy families who lived on Fifth Avenue. Um, and it was all an extension of the Gilded Age. Yes. These people were the true successes, and everyone looked up to them and thought, maybe, just maybe, I can have some small piece of that later on. Every immigrant to the country was looking for a piece of that, um, and it was, you know, it was the ideal to follow. And that's what makes this movie interesting, because my parents knew this firsthand. Everyone in that period talked about these very wealthy families. And my parents were born in 1907 and 1911, but overseas, but they, my mom came here when she was just a little girl, eight, eight or nine years old. And my dad went to Europe and lived in Germany. And that's another story when, and, and then France, they ran out in 1923, they got the hell out of there. When Hitler took over the, the Bavaria, they got the heck out of there. But the bottom line is my mother, same thing, you know, when, when she, she went to work for the two Morgan sisters, one of whom was married to a Vanderbilt. And she always used to talk about how she did design work with, with these two, Van, the Vanderbilt, you know, Mrs. Gloria Vanderbilt's mother and Lady Furness. She was hung up on this thing too, you know, and they were from that era. So they sort of had some residue, as you're saying, for those years, you know, for the early 1900 years. So, yeah, it's, we're getting close. Yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Well, I, I believe in documentaries. I believe that you can educate yourself painlessly with documentaries like this. And I, I'll be looking for more documentaries like this one, um, because I think it, it gives you not only, quote, a colorful view of, of things, it lets you connect the dots from then till now. It lets you understand the trends, especially in American history, on history in general. Um, and finally, it lets you make a comparison between the way things were at one point in time and the way things were at another point in time. And if you watch this movie, you can understand the depression in the 30s much better. If you watch this movie, you can understand, um, you know, the issues that the country was facing in the 19th century and how those issues maybe didn't really go away into the 20th century, uh, into the 1920s, into the depression and beyond. So it's a, it's a continuum. 
And, and uh, part of being patriotic, part of understanding today and the ebb and flow of American history, the, the social historical mesh that holds us together is to understand the history. Uh, I think one of the things that, that's come out about Ukraine, we didn't really talk about that, we should take a minute, um, is that the people in Ukraine understand it's a very complex history and they do understand, they study it. It becomes part of a sort of a patriotic, a patriotic milieu that they live in. If you want to be patriotic, you need to understand what happened. And if you don't understand what happened, you can't be patriotic, cannot be. But let's let's go to the question. I asked you before the show, I, I said, you know, George, we have to connect this up uh, to the Ukraine uh, issue, the invasion right now. Uh, I don't know how we can do that. And you found a way. What's the connection? Ultimate power, autocracy, who power in the hands of one or just a few people. And they've got the power. Putin is an autocrat. He gets what he wants. He's an, he, he runs Russia, you know, and these industrialists, they were running like marionette, you know, the, the president and the Congress is, was, was there, they were running the marionettes. So it's, it has to do with ultimate power, power in, in the hands of one or just a few people concentrated power. That's, that's, that's the connection here. It teaches us about the tension, which is forever, um, between the, the power of government, especially autocratic, powerful, corrupt government, uh, and the power of the people. Um, it's something that has been, you know, a tension forever in the human race. And um, we experienced it in the 19th century, you could see by what was going on. If it hadn't, you know, if it hadn't worked out the way it did, it could have been really an awful country. We could have lost our democracy entirely. Yeah. Um, the, the, you ask, uh, you know, what is the tipping point for democracy? It's every day. It's every citizen. Yeah. And, and this was a rough and ready, a, a raw experience for everyone trying to find, invent, polish, tune up, and create a better world for everyone. Um, and there are so many, many stories in this period that are hard on you, that are hard on history, that are hard on people. And yet somehow we came out of it um, by dint of effort, by dint of a few leaders, um, by dint of a, a patriotism that emerged out of an optimism that life would be, could be better. Um, that's why it's so important to study this period. Definitely. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. So what would you give the documentary, George? A 10. <laughs> I, like, I like the documentary. It was very comprehensive from a historical background, because I have a background in history. It was comp it really took the whole period and dealt with all the different issues with the, you know, the populists and the capitalists and and and, and the government and how everything played together. And then the personalities involved, you know, Mary Elizabeth Lees and, and William Jennings Bryan, Henry George, or all the different players. Um, really good, good documentary. Excellent, excellent documentary. I'll give yeah. it 10. I would too. These, these are true American heroes, mm -hmm. truly altruistic, mm -hmm. truly mm, uh, uh, risking their lives, indeed, uh, spending their lives working for the greater good. Uh, and we need that now. Another reason to watch this movie and understand how people emerged from the workaday world uh, and became leaders uh, with such great sacrifices in that very period. So go watch it, everybody. Go watch it. Definitely. Uh, any ideas for the next one, George? Uh, I'll have to put my thinking cap on. You're, you're watching a lot more movies because, you know, I'm in school and I've got other community things I'm doing. I'm pretty stretched right now. So, you know, if you can find something, I'll look at it. Um, I don't watch many movies, uh, you know, except some once in a while. But if you find something that hits your eye, you know, you like, I'm willing to go with it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you where my head is right now, and you can think about it. Yeah. Um, there's a number of movies, both on the documentary side and, and on the docudrama side, about um, the, the uh, eighth century. 
uh, in Scandinavia with um, the Vikings. And uh, I, I probably will suggest something along those lines to you. Okay, yeah. okay next time, a couple of weeks. George, it's great to have these discussions with you. I really appreciate it. It's very important in our time to extend our thinking um, beyond beyond our beyond our daily lives. Definitely, definitely. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Take care. Aloha. Take care. Aloha, Jay. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.